Hello listeners of the Lee Miller Fashion in Wartime Britain podcast, I'm Amy Bouhassen. And if you liked hearing about Lee Miller's work, you might be interested to know that we also have an another entirely different podcast looking at the love letters that Lee and Roland sent to one another before the war. Until now, these letters have only been seen by a handful of people. On the podcast, they're completely unedited, so you'll hear exactly what they said to each other, even the rude bits. Starting in 1937, the letters are beautifully written and chart both the complexities of their relationship and of world politics just prior to the Second World War. As you'll hear, the letters are presented with some fantastic insights from specialists and experts, so you'll always know what's going on. Before we jump into this episode, I'm going to bring you up to speed with what's happened in the series so far. Having met at a ball in Paris in 1937, Lee and Roland started on a whirlwind summer of romance and excitement, which included surrealist summer camps in the south of France with the likes of Picasso, Man Ray and Leonora Carrington, and week-long parties in Cornwall. The only fly in the ointment was that Lee, who by this point had already established herself as a photographer in her own right, was married and normally lived in Cairo with her husband Aziz. In this episode, Lee has just landed in Egypt after leaving Roland behind in France. In 1937, Egypt had undergone a political transformation. I'm Hilary Roberts, Senior Curator of Photography at Imperial War Museums, Britain's National Museum of Modern Conflict. The Anglo-Egyptian Treaty, signed in London in 1936, had proclaimed Egypt to be an independent sovereign state but allowed for British troops to continue to be stationed in the Suez Canal zone to protect Britain's financial and strategic interests in the canal, the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. These developments were the result of a protracted but substantial transfer of power from Britain to Egypt, which took place during the 1920s and the early 1930s. During this time, an Egyptian national political elite and closely linked groups of Egyptian businessmen became increasingly influential in the country, fostering economic, cultural and political independence from Britain. This was the world that Lee would come into. In this next letter, Lee goes on a trip to the desert town of Siwa. Setting out, she was leaving behind her metropolitan life in Cairo. So yeah, I mean, a trip to Siwa would have been quite difficult. It was very, very isolated for much of the 19th century. It's in a depression. There's an oasis and it's a small town around the oasis. I mean, it's surrounded by what is called the Great Sand Sea, uh, which, as the name suggests, is basically endless desert in almost every direction. My name is Hussein Omar, and I am a lecturer in modern global history at University College Dublin. But um, Siwa was always on the periphery. It's always had a strange marginal status within Egypt. Siwi, the language, is a sort of Berber-related language, is, is not spoken in any other part of the country. And so try as they might to bring Siwa under their authority, as they often did, particularly as it was the first kind of significant town on the border with Libya and was therefore very important for defining Egypt in territorial terms, the ruling authorities. They, they had very, very little luck in imposing that authority. And so famously in Siwa, there's a kind of long tradition of same-sex male marriage, which the authorities had tried to eradicate, but which they couldn't really do so successfully. The remoteness of Siwa from the rest of Egypt would certainly have made this an exciting expedition for Lee and appealed to her adventurous side. It also inspired her greatly. Some of her most famous surreal pictures come from these adventures. In fact, we're not sure if it was this particular trip, but Portrait of Space was taken in a rest house on the road to Siwa. The textured part of the picture is the fly-screened window of the rest house. The frame within that is the part you put your arm through to open the window. And through the frame, you see the clouds in the shape of a bird, maybe flying away somewhere on another trip. 
The picture as a whole seems emblematic to her search and want of freedom. This is on incredibly thin ivory paper and it's got Carrier Egypt SAE paper on the top of it. It's dated the 15th of October. Darling, believe it or not is just all I can say about this adventure. I landed in a mess and with very little trouble with customs. In fact, they passed everything through out of courtesy, except the painting which I declared and they valued at one pound. Don't tell Man Ray. All that was also courtesy, my declaring it and their valuation. There's a 33% duty on works of art and all luxury articles such as decorations. It all took hours, however, and it was midnight before I reached home. The luggage arrived by cart at two and I left for Siwa at eight. I telephoned the Hopkinsons to say hello to party where they were. They were sorry they wouldn't see me as they were going to Siwa and if I wasn't too tired, why not come? I was so tired, I said yes by accident, rather like going to Cornwall. They were more surprised than I and were probably only asking out of politeness. It's the sort of expedition that one prepares weeks in advance. I dug out the well-known octopus shit-covered blue shorts, three dirty shirts, a thermos bottle, the blue velvet trouser combination from the depth of my messy luggage, the polarised glasses, 12 rolls of film and creme nivea plus ampho vaccine, and off I went. There was no road, just desert track, rocks, sand and space. No water, no rest, jolting, jouncing, cursing, followed by a hot wind going the same 20 kilos an hour we could make. Sweating, parched, aching back and swollen feet, we were relieved once by sighting the sea at a lighthouse deserted 15 years ago, and we drove down for a swim. Very mysterious, beautiful blue-green water. I thought then that it was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever seen, but changed my mind at Mercer Matrua. However, that particular given moment, which nothing to do with my discomfort in heat, it was really better than the average at Mercer. Five shades of blue as the water changed going out, and when I was in it, the surface reflected the palest and tenderest of pinks. The sky all dappled and René Magritte, and the sand dead white, made from pulverised shell, hardened in ripples for miles around where it was wet, and running in your hand like some fantastic breakfast food in flat oval grains. Some Sudanese coast guards were doing a very curious performance on the shore, stamping on great sacks of something with long ropes attached in the seawater, their camels glaring at the whole proceeding. Aziz went along to ask what they were doing, and it was some sort of grain that they feed to camels. It must be soaked in water first and salted, so they combine the two by taking it to the sea. That would please Man Ray, because no animal can live without ordinary salt, especially the camels, on their long treks because it holds the body water. The lighthouse was the metallic kind, just a tall hollow tower of steel with a steel staircase inside and four legs cantilevered to the side spreading out and supporting it against the tremendous winds. It had had a prism lens made of long curved optical glass bars, like the ham factory, most of which had disappeared though. Some shattered were lying on the ground blown out by the wind. The walls and floors of the dependent buildings were still intact and made private, roofless bathing houses. Naturally, we got stuck in the sand on leaving and it took two hours and a half to dig ourselves out, even with the aid of Italian army sand mats, reached Mercer Matrua way after dark. Yeah, I don't think Mercer Matrua would have been a huge tourist destination, though people certainly knew about it through the writings of Ahmed Hassanin Pasha, who, who went on a famous trip through the Western Desert, uh, published as The Lost Oasis. And the figure on whom the English patient then sort of gets based is, is certainly reading it, and it is an account of travel through the Western Desert. And I think Lee uh, and certainly Aziz would have known about that text, if not known him personally. 
During the last scare, it was a military post of several thousand troops and is now the principal coast defence because they were old Roman wells, re-excavated and put in use, and very rich soil which eventually can be put back under cultivation with irrigation as the Romans used to do. Mercer was one of the capitals of Cleopatra, and it was there where she went with Antony after the naval disaster. Sea, lagoons, rocks, the place where Cleo bathed. A huge mountain of rock half out into the sea has been hollowed out with three rooms, in one of which is a sort of sunken pool tub which fills and empties with high and low water in which she used to sit all day long during the heat of summer. Infinite variations of blue and curious wave and sun-worn rocks, all of which have even more weird surface, as if they'd been heavily painted in violet grey, which is now dripping and melting down. Swimming at dawn and racing over sand dunes, there's a very swell 14-room hotel built last year to accommodate visiting officials during army stay and is still kept open, God knows for whom. One could stay there forever, but no one ever would. There are even two villas for let. We arrived through the rocky passes down to Siwa just at sunset and could see the skyscraper towers built of mud in the distance, disguising themselves to look like the upjutting rocks around. Rather like the Puy de Dome. For no reason at all, great rocks coming out of level land. Though, in France at least, there was a mountainous area around. In the distance, the rocks looked like savage thatched huts, with the hard surface thrusting out under the worn soft rock below like a roof. It was already dark by the time we reached the rest house. I was in a state of collapse from the trip and didn't recover until the drums had been beating for hours for the fantasia of Siwan and Arabic dancing that had been scheduled for the evening. It made me understand in advance how they could dance like that for hour on end, and was told that they could go on for several days, because it brought even me to life. With a tremendous acetylene lamp on the pole, the sea winds ranged in a circle formation on one side and the Arabs on the other. They don't mix even for fun. The sea were men were dancing and jumping round in a circle or around a pipe player and two tambours, singing in their language a song about... I love the boy with a long bang of hair in his eyes and when I look into his eyes I fall down burning all over. Dressed in every variety of rags and species of covering from heavy local rugs to ordinary Egyptian jaleba with turbans, caps, shawls or nothing, they seem to do every step as individuals and all at the same time in each other's ways from the black bottom to the American Indian rain dance, without any organisation, the whole crowd whipping them on with noises like dogs and whoopies. All of a sudden the Bedouins wanted their turn, and you couldn't ask the Siwans to stop because their feelings would be hurt. Though they didn't mind both performing to the different music, a different show in exactly the same place. So the Arabs started their kind of music, and a veiled woman did a hip dance under mountains of clothes, the Arabs clapping very hard in a frenzy and in time to their music. She held an ordinary Charlie Chaplin walking stick in her hands, above the head, and when we started clapping with the others, she got in such a state of excitement that she came backwards and rubbed her bottom against our men's knees. Then a Siwan got a stick and started dancing in front of her in the old Harlem system and they outdid in sexual suggestion anything I've ever seen there, because they were both covered in mountains of clothing and didn't even resemble human forms anymore. So there must have been some dancing. There were no other native women present, but the next day we saw Siwan girls. They were very strange and attractive, but impossible to photograph unless one had a telephoto lens, as even at the sight of us they would run spitting and cursing and making signs against the evil eye. So the women of Siwa are up until this day, actually. I mean, I went to Siwa for the first time in 1998. And I personally remember being shocked. Almost every single woman we saw, some of a very young age, 
were wearing face coverings. And that certainly wasn't the case in Cairo. And there's a special sort of type of veil of a kind of, it looks like a sort of blue and white gingham with the kind of distinctive orange and red cross stitch on top of it that is very typical of Siwa. And I remember even in 1998 being surprised by the difference between Cairo and Siwa. When they are young, they wear a silver solid bar around their necks. And when they're ready to be had, they add to it a large plaque all engraved in silver. Siwan jewellery is very distinct. They have these large silver discs. That was a tradition that I think died out probably in the middle or in the third quarter of the 20th century. And there was a moment in which Siwan silver in particular got discovered by foreign collectors sort of in the 70s. And this kind of ancestral jewellery that would have been passed down got bought up. And I have a vague memory that the largest collection of Siwan jewellery is in Zurich. When they marry, they veil and are never seen face to face again. They have an extremely hard time as the men are all pederasts. And even though some of them marry, they keep a boy on the ground floor and the woman on the top floor. Until five years ago, when the Egyptian government decided to do something about it, there was no legal marriage among men and also among women. They didn't want to cause bloodshed and disaster, and so instead of stopping the goings-on altogether, they started by banning the legal marriage service between the same sex and to gradually change them over the period of years, if possible. Until five years ago, when road connections were made possible the way we did it, you can see that very few natives ever left, or that there was very little change in the population. About 40 days by camel, it was really something. They have water and dates and a bit of grain for their bread, nothing that they can export or make money with. And due to the distances, tea and petrol are the only outside things they have. Chicken and goat is the only meat. And there's one dog in the oasis. People have tried, but someone always catches it and fries it for dinner. There are the ruins of the Temple of Jupiter Amon and a big well in which I swam. In the daytime, the towers were disappointing because the government evacuated them five years ago for sanitary reasons, and so they're all falling apart. They were built of mud. In the old days, you didn't buy land, but rented or bought the roof of someone's house and built three storeys on top of it, etc. Hence the skyscrapers. But it's still mysterious in the moonlight. All the population was dying of malaria and typhoid and dysentery, and now it's very healthy. So I guess they were probably right. In spite of the swamps, the only insects we saw were flies. But in such quantities, it seemed like a nightmare. or practical joke. The dates attract and feed them, and the very sweet grapes that grow in salt water. We were all dreadfully ill because we had to take three cups of tea at the sheikh's house. You have to drink them. It's practically poison. The first cup is extremely strong with sugar, the second stronger with mint, and the third with both mint and sugar, all enough to cure the worst case of burning and certainly made us nearly vomit in his face. However, we contained ourselves until we were out of sight and out of sound. The smell wouldn't make any difference there. I mean, I suspect that in Cairo, Lee would not have had that kind of exposure to people of a different social class. Aziz's family was part of a cosmopolitan Kyrene elite. And in the socially stratified world of Cairo, she may not have had the experience of having tea with a member of a different social class. But I suspect that Lee is a female foreign traveler in Siwa would have been as curious to the people of Siwa as much as she found them exotic. I took an awful lot of pictures and hope that they are interesting enough to send you. I've just been to the hotel and got two of your letters. I was in such a state of exhaustion and depression after the trip, and really just today settling down and realising that I'm back in my old life. I can't picture you alone in the house. It seems my house too. 
I think you should keep a series of cuties in it so it will never be quite alone. Incidentally, cuties right, though I find the letters QT better, as it means in Yankee slang, on the sly, used in this manner. I will take her out on the QT or do something on the QT. I'm in the seventh circle of paradise about my portrait and can't wait. I'm planning to come down myself to fish it out of customs. I think it ought to be insured, but don't for anything mark the real valuation on the shipment, unless it would automatically invalidate the insurance. Is the background pink and the face yellow, or vice versa? I can't remember as I'm too dizzy at the prospect to think of it straight. As you can imagine, I've had no chance to open my baggage properly or get any of the misplaced or undelivered pictures in order. Also, I'm only staying in Alex two days longer, so I won't be able to do anything about it until reaching Cairo. As you can see, I'm out of practice with this machine or any other, but I'll practice on you. Besides being tired makes me put words and letters backwards. This is the only airline paper in the house, so I've had to go back and use the reverse side. Also, Aziz has been reading over my shoulder from time to time as I wrote, so it will have to stay just a descriptive letter. I haven't time to write what I want to. Just to say that I love you more than ever. And darling, I hope you meant everything you wrote me. I think of you constantly and maddeningly, and often speak or say something as if you were there and would understand what I'm talking about. And then it's such a horrible shock to have to catch myself up in such a strain, and I want to cry and scream for you. Write to me at the house from now on, unless I tell you differently. Villa Albait, Sharira Sabri Pasha, Doki, Giza, Cairo. Your Duke. The street, Shara Abdul Rahim Sabri, which is one of the main streets going through Doki. It's a kind of leafy, then suburb of Cairo, and it's just across the Nile from the island of Zamalek, where a lot of the people that Lee would have socialized with would have lived. Thursday, 21st of October. My darling, Something told me I was posting my letter to you yesterday in too much of a hurry. In fact, when I got back to the house after dinner, there was your desert card from Sewer and your letter. I have already read every word of it several times. Your descriptions of your journey are marvellous. For years I have wanted to go there, but now I hardly need to. As seen through your typewriter, it is as good as real and with the flies and bad tent fitted out. Incidentally, your typewriter is a very charming machine, since it conveys as much temperament as any pen with its flights into pounds, and its very original type, which I like reading for more reasons than one. What a superb trip it must have been. The lighthouse, the bathing, the dancing in the town itself must have been marvellous. I am writing this now in a great hurry, so that you will not pay too much attention to the gloom of my last letter. It is very sweet of you to write such good letters. It makes all the difference. I am so happy when I get them. Tripota arrives this afternoon, probably full of new projects for activities surrealists. I hope he won't make too many long speeches. My patience is not what it used to be. Thea is still here, very sweet, and puts up with a lot of things, particularly my continual preoccupation for you. She's a nice girl, and I enjoy poking around the Caledonian market with her and dining at the Ivy with queer Russians and what not. Darling, I must be off downtown. I love you more than ever. I love you with every fibre, nerve, bone, muscle, Sense, gland, hair, tooth, eye, etc. Don't forget to send the photos of Siwa when you can. I hope there are some of you among them. All my love, Roland. In 1937, it was clear that Egypt would be vital to the British should war break out and was likely to become the centre of operations in the Middle East. However, 
this was not a priority shared by the Egyptians themselves. The Egyptian government would offer only nominal support to Britain, while the Egyptian people themselves were largely apathetic. It was a society which was changing. It was discovering its own identity, its own culture, and colonialism and the old guard was in decline. It is not surprising that Lee found the expatriate society difficult to join when she came there after her marriage. 22nd of October. My darling, I'm so depressed. It suddenly hit me, the gloom and the letdown. I want to cry, and I do cry. I'm back just long enough away from you, just far enough, and love you just enough that everything is unbearable. It was all very gay, dashing off to the desert, scarcely arrived in port, and the first two days of Cairo were laughing and homecoming, full of how are yous, of what did you do, and vows of making it an amusing winter. Wherefore, I've been to the cinema three times, a garden party, a picnic, a bridge, the lending library, the swimming pool, and to bed with insomnia. That will complete the entire schedule for the next six months. Only maybe I'll get so I like it, or don't mind it, or anything else. But I can't go on thinking of you, permanently, gnawing, secretly. It's poisoning me and killing me. The only bright moment was going to the framers this afternoon. Naturally, any instinct or bright ideas completely betray or desert me in the face of fact. The minute I'm here, I become devoid of any inspiration. It must be natural searching for protective colouring, trying to become like the mass. The Holy Ghost is being framed between two large pieces of glass with several inches clear space around it and very narrow black border holding it together so that if one day you make me a companion piece, it can go on the back and become reversible. Max Ernst is being done in several inches of wide, plain, bevelled wood, decoed in several coats of white. And if I don't like it, I can simply change the colour. And your two beautiful montages will, for the moment, have just the simplest and narrowest of black frames, so that they have no interference. It's very difficult because being impatient, I can't wait or do without them on my walls until I think up a really good idea and way of doing the montages. And since they have here only standard moulding frames turned out by the meter in various antique gildings and mottling, it makes me so sick I can think of nothing else. I'm sorry, but I do still think of the watercolour as the Holy Ghost. Or maybe it's a duck in a bath of blood. And darling, I love you. It's very nice that Thea is with you. I liked her very much, which is a great deal, in that everyone was for days running her down before I met her, and I'm easily put off people in that way. I hope you're as tender with her as you know how to be, because if she likes me and is replacing me, especially so soon, it's as if she were me, and I could feel it. My long touristic letter to you is establishing an obvious and public precedent in writing to you, commencing a long correspondence which includes the sending of photos, etc. Was I clever? This is another section, as I have to put the sheets away very carefully in between times. I'm feeling a little less depressed, at least not suicidal. Mayfie, my brother's wife, gave a cocktail party and I got myself plastered, so slept well and feel more cheery. And also I'm going at dawn on a fishing trip for two days to the Red Sea. It won't be much fun at all, but it will at least fill in the time until I can hope for a letter from you. I'm fiddling around nervously all the time and Aziz keeps asking me what I'm dreaming about or restless about. I do so want to seem well and happy after my long vacation alone so as to give a precedent of it being a good thing for me, but I'm afraid I'm making a sorry job of it. Don't think I'm even more stupid like I was about your swimming too far out, but would you ask or tell your brother Leon to let me know if you're ever ill or if anything happens to you such as jail, sudden death or change of heart and loss of memory? It worries me to know that you might be in the middle of having an appendix out and that I might not know it. Please arrange that and tell me when it settles so I won't be frantic if I don't get a letter from you sometime for a long time. 
I've done the same with my sister-in-law, as I had to break down and tell someone about you. She's very sympathetic, and I couldn't have chosen anyone more suited to a situation of this kind. Lee had two brothers, her older brother John, who she didn't get on terribly well with. They were hugely competitive, and I think that actually the competitiveness between the two of them is part of her driving force to be successful when she's younger. He became a very distinguished aviator. Um, He built his own aeroplane when he was only 17 years old, taught himself to fly, and became one of the first pilots to fly the early gyrocopter, which then became what's now known as a helicopter. Eric was Lee's youngest brother, and he was the one who'd been her studio assistant in her New York studio. He was also the poor sod who had to close up her studio and put everything away and sort everything out when she decided to up sticks and move to Cairo with Aziz in 1934. I think Lee felt quite guilty about this because she was leaving him at the tail end of the depression in America. So for him to find another job would have been quite difficult. Lee managed to convince Aziz to give Eric an engineering job in Cairo. So eventually Eric and his wife Mayfi moved to live in Cairo as well. Mayfi and Lee became very, very close friends. You might have noticed just a little bit earlier that she mentioned very briefly about being stupid about Roland swimming out too far in the sea. When she was a teenager, her first true love and her went on a boating trip and unbeknownst to her and the boy, he had a weak heart. And At some point during the trip, the boy had a heart attack and drowned in front of her. As far as we know, this tiny little reference in her letter is the only time that she ever spoke to Roland about this. It's very much an example of her not imparting the full information about the traumas that she had as a child, like her childhood rape as well. And these kind of things Roland never found out about in full until after Lee had died. I'm so pleased at the idea of my portrait, but I'm very sad that yours has so permanently escaped to America. It was much less like you and really not as good a picture as the one of me, but I hate to have it so far out of circulation as America. I could always have hoped otherwise to have run into it accidentally and would have been on the constant lookout for it. The background was pink and the face was yellow and the hair was green. The portraits that Lee mentions here are part of a set that Picasso painted at Mougins. He painted Lee six times and Roland during this period. The fate of Roland's portrait is particularly interesting. Roland claims it was sent to the United States, but we don't think that was true. I'm Anthony Penrose. Lee and Roland were my parents. And I'm recording this in our old family home, Farley's in East Sussex. Many, many years later, the photographer David Douglas Duncan got access to Picasso's inner sanctum where he kept the paintings he didn't want anybody else to see. And there, there was a painting which we believe to be Roland Penrose's portrait by Picasso. In that moment, Picasso was painting the men of the party, Paul Eluard and Roland, dressed as women, as Arlesiennes. There's a wonderful picture of Paul dressed in this manner breastfeeding a cat. And Roland also has become an Arlesian. I think it was a kind of running gag at that moment. And I think Picasso didn't want Roland to see the painting because there were a few kind of like unfinished areas and he wasn't satisfied with it. I've had great difficulty in explaining how I came to acquire a picture by Picasso as a gift from you. But I got over that part all right. And, and... And uh, and it's all very maddening. I was boasting when I pretended out of sight, out of mind. I can never forget you. I can't even avoid thinking and being with you for five minutes at a time. Either I like doing things because they have some remote, even relation to you, or wearing my beautiful necklace, which is even more lovely here, far away, than it was in Paris. Or some silly little thing that you alone would understand. Or... I hate everything because it's got no contact or inside thought of you. Darling, someone's coming, so I have to fold this away quickly. 
My heart is very sick, and I love you, your Duke. If you'd like to hear more episodes like this, please head to Patreon and search for Lee Miller Archives. The memberships that enable you to listen to the podcast start at £7 a month and your support will go towards looking after Farley's, the home of Roland and Lee. It also helps us care for their important archives and legacy. For this episode of Love Letters Bound in Gold Handcuffs, the contributors were Hilary Roberts of the Imperial War Museums London, Dr. Hussein Omar, lecturer in Modern Global History at University College Dublin, Anthony Penrose, co-director of the Lee Miller Archives and son of Lee Miller and Roland Penrose. Roland Penrose's letters were read by Adam Grayson, Lee Miller's and the narration by me, Amy Bouhassen. The music was composed by David Cullen and the episode was produced by Tolly Robinson. All content and the letters in this episode are copyright the Lee Miller Archives 2021.